Hey everyone, Jocular Claymore here, and welcome back to Disco Elysium. So, last we left off, we um, found Ceiling, who's a very friendly merchant, told us about the lady driver who we're still looking for, and then we um, just finished speaking with Joyce. Uh, she gave us more information about the Union, a uh, group of mercenaries called the um, Cornell, I think. Um, so, we finished... Uh, the, uh, what do you call it? The Jam Mystery, uh, quest line. Yeah. So, we interrogated the drivers about the smuggling, we found out who's the lady driver and where's her lorry. We haven't found the driver herself yet, but we're still looking. We searched her cabin, we found, uh, tools, um, old movie posters, uh, and a radio, and then we reported back to Joyce. Uh, so, um, I think... The best thing we can do now is just go through these um, other tasks. I do want to... We have the pry bar now, so we can open that trash container uh, in the yard by the body. So let's head over there. And we're keeping an eye on the clock on the bottom right. Uh, once it hits 2100, we need to be at the, um, the balcony. The apartment where we saw the man smoking a cigarette because he clearly knows something about the murder all I can think about is this game to be honest <laughs> alright so here is the grizzly murder site let's open this this trash container is locked the sliding lid as a padlock that says, whirling in rags. Oh, we have to equip the tool. Oh, let's see. Where are you? Uh, maybe because we're in a dialogue thing. Let's leave first. Yeah, there it is. Okay. Uh, tools. Pry bar. That's in our right. Okay. Now let's try it. This trash container is locked. The sliding lid has a padlock that says, whirling in rags. Still a very, very low chance. Okay, let's try you stick the oh? pry bar into the fissure beneath the lid and push down. It doesn't take much force. With a satisfying crack, the metal gives way. You can open the lid now. I did not think we were going to make that, but all right, I'll take it. <laughs> Don't. Maybe you shouldn't. What's this? Open the lid another time, maybe. What's this? Just the feeling. A warning from <clears throat> some part of you. Nah, let's open the lid. The smell of rotten food rises to greet you. You see soggy cartons, dirty rags, and organic waste. We're just in time. This hasn't been emptied for over a week. Let's look under the boxes of carton. You see milk and egg rest with one broken egg in it. Some pasta wrapper. Picking up the soggy packages somehow feels familiar. We're also wearing gloves, so I, I don't know if that makes things easier, but hopefully. You've done this before. The movements are recorded in your elbows, the methodology in your fingers. You're used to this. Used to what? Dumpster diving? No, searching for evidence in the trash. Hmm. Let's dive further. A box falls into pieces in your hands. Batiste Soleil cereal. There are plastic pasta packages below and turbo noodles. Nothing of note, however. All right. Let's then look at... Pick up the rags. Among the threadbare kitchen towels, something catches your eye. A pair of denim trousers. Grab them. As the legs of the slime-covered jeans begin to unspool from the garbage, a rank corpse smell fills the air. Oh, is there a body in here? The victim's clothes? <laughs> Cadaverine odor is faint. If these belong to the deceased, they were removed when he was still in the early stages of decay. Drop them in here, officer. 
The lieutenant produces a black plastic bag marked evidence from his pocket. Bag the trousers. Guitar marked blue jeans. Pocket empty or emptied. He wore them with a belt, too. A white belt. The loops appear stretched, but... He looks into the container. The belt is missing. That's it. Do you see anything else in there? I have another bag here. Something slimy catches your eye. <laughs> I like how there's... Nope. Reach for it. A drab, long-sleeved shirt, olive-colored, appears from the food waste, dripping with pus. Ew. Bag the shirt. This is a military type overgarment. No label or serial number. This is the kind of rib knit shirt that's worn over light armor to conceal it in an urban scenario. Anything more? The rest of the rags are just kitchen variety waste. A yellow old mug that catches your eye. But other than that. A thrown out towel, a mug, that's all. All right. We should go to Gart again and ask if he knows who put the clothes in the trash. It could be as simple as someone from the hostel cleaning the yard. Or that one. <laughs> I'd advise against confronting that force. <laughs> uh, Gart, I think, is the cafeteria manager, right? The bartender in the whirling and rags. Um, yeah, we need to ask the kids who put them here. Now the kids aren't going to help. You think someone from the whirling might have been involved, maybe? Not really. All we know is <laughs> the victim's clothes are in the trash. The lid was locked, and his establishment had the key. It's just a small loose thread. I mean, we can ask the kids, but I doubt it'll help. The fuck's he on about <laughs> kids? You hear that, Kuno? He thinks you're an infant or something. See? Okay. The lieutenant nods, then looks back into the trash container. Search the food waste. It's just organic waste, cold and slimy on your hands. Apple and potato pills, mostly. Unidentified sludge and the occasional chicken bone thrown in for good measure. But hey, what's this? What? A blue piece of plastic sticks out from the apple peels. It's shiny. Looks like the corner of something. Shiny. Pick it out. Something larger. Oh. A clipboard. A blue plastic clipboard with moist papers hanging from it. They look badly damaged, but you can still make out forms and notes. Written in a man's handwriting. Can you tell by someone's handwriting what their gender is? Or hmm. Officer, is that your paperwork? Uh, no, it can't be. Yes, it is. Look. This plastic has the RCM street grid on it. You've even got an autopsy form. A miserable looking slip of paper sticks to the board. Interesting. If you don't mind me asking, how did this get in the trash? It must have been cramping my style. It has a foreboding quality to it. Maybe I needed to lose it for the great bloodletting to begin. I think I didn't want to be a cop anymore, so I threw it away. Someone from the whirling threw it in the trash? I don't know. I'm boring. I'd rather not... I'd rather not to talk about it right now. I'd rather not talk about it right now? Um, let's see. I don't know, I'm boring. Boring? Try dangerous. You should do a thorough inventory of that. Be sure some has not fallen into the hands of the RCM's enemies, organized crime, or worse. Official notes sometimes contain informants' names, even undercover operatives. Okay, I'll do that. Yeah, I'll do that. It would also not hurt to start taking notes on the case. Now, tell me what your eagle eyes see. Or are we finished? Some items, such as the ledger you found, are interactable. Go to your inventory and select the Interact tab to read your paperwork. Let's do that before I forget. Oh, well, after I finish the best game. Um, the mug, I'm getting that mug too. You pick out a broken mug with an oddly racist depiction of the yellow man frolicking in saffron. Yikes. An antique. <laughs> Only in its social sensibility. I see. Take the mug. Mm -hmm. Mm hmm. The lieutenant briefly glances at the mug, then returns his sight to the trash. You've acquired an interactable item. Investigate this item further, okay. 
by going... The container sounds a muffled gong. Yeah, should yet. That's one thing off the list. I think we got it all. And sleep. Now, let's see our inventory. Intractables. Okay. Yeah, the gun wrapper, I remember we interacted with that a few episodes ago. Let's check out the ledger. This is the ledger you found in the trash. It's full of notes written in the man's dense cursive. Have a closer look. Maybe it can be salvaged to start keeping notes on the case? It's the ledger you found in the trash. A pitiful cabbage of white and yellow papers hanging from plastic board, barely held together by a metal clip. This sad display is made complete by the faint smell of urinal cleaner. <laughs> urinal cleaner. Anything else? There's a piece of toilet paper. Or is it cleaning tissue? No, it's toilet paper. Desperately sticking to the back of the blue plastic clipboard. Gross. It's a metaphor <laughs> for you. Thanks. Thank you, waterlogged ledger, for spelling it out for us. All right. Inspect the toilet paper. It's just toilet paper sticking to the back of the plastic clipboard. You can take it off if you want. Take it off. Leave it there. It's cool. Maybe it's kitchen tissue. They look exactly the same. Just take it off. Still wet, the toilet paper peels off the plastic easily. All you have to do is shake it off with your finger and voila, the ledger now looks marginally better. I'm glad we're wearing gloves. Uh, inspect the clip. An aluminium block runs the width of the board, biting down on the paperwork. Its crocodile teeth are the only thing keeping the papers together. A regular pencil, the tip worn down to nothing, has been attached to the clip. Run your finger across the aluminum. Aluminium. The surface is interrupted by a silvery sticker. It's rectangular, sparkling with iridescence. You don't know how you didn't notice it before. Looks like an official mark, made to be low visibility outside the right circumstances. Hey, Lieutenant, what is this? Pointed sticker. What? That thing. It's a halogen watermark. We use it for adding information to RCM property. Interesting. What kind of information? It depends. Aside from an anti-counterfeiting stamp, mine has my station number and address. The information varies by date of issue. Maybe yours will have how many cases you've solved. How can I read it? Any capable light with the right wavelength will do. Like, for example, we do have a flashlight. Would that work? All RCM vehicles have headlights designed to reveal halogen oh. watermarks. Mine too. So we'll have to go back to the car, I guess? This means you can read the watermarks if you just turn the lights on. That's all, thank you. Okay. He returns to his neatly kept notes. While a bunch of sodden papers sag from the clipboard in your hand, it's a sorry sight. Browse the white papers. They're not exactly white. They're yellowed in patches by sunlight and alcohol, and covered in dense blue handwriting. Ink escapes into watercolor patterns, reaching its tendrils across entire pages. The paper itself is checkered, with faint red lines, forming short paragraphs. Once in a while, there's a red stamp that exclaims, Case files commit to paper. The case files themselves are plenty. You count more than a hundred sodden, crumpled up, earmarked pages falling apart in your hands. They appear to be sufficiently organized and extremely dense, if mostly illegible. What is in there? What are they about? Work, strife, poverty, the Jamrock Quarter. These are handwritten logs of investigations dating back to January 51, this year. The exact number is hard to estimate, due to missing pages and an odd naming convention. But there are at least 20, maybe 30 cases, undertaken, not completed, mind you. Okay. It's the middle of March. You have attempted two cases a week on average. Is that a lot or a little? What do you mean? Is that all? <laughs> uh, that's it? There's two cases a week, a good case, though, Lieutenant. That was mention of a intervention here. Count the pages. Um, I mean, that's the question I asked, so let's try this. Huh? 
Too complex cases to undertake is a lot, yes. You really have to push yourself. I would not suggest it, lest you start making mistakes. Two cases a week appears to have been my load, Lieutenant. I'm not sure I completed them, though. Two? That's a lot. I didn't mean to say you are making mistakes, by the way. That was presumptuous of me. It's alright, Ken. Um, I'm sure I made plenty of mistakes. I burned out, alright. A nice brisk pace, the way I like it. Um, I burned out, alright. That's okay. We all do, sooner or later. Oh, Kim. I love Kim. <laughs> like a fan of girls, the checkered papers dry in your hand. The handwriting is extremely dense, if mostly illegible. There is mention of a naming convention here? Yes. It appears you employ a, shall we say, robust yet literary system. Each investigation has its case number written on the margins. Yet, still more tellingly, most are accompanied by a name. A title, one might say even. One that draws inspiration from snoop fiction and vespertine cop show staples. Oh my, and they're written in capital letters too. Yes, all caps. One is called The Next World Mural. Another, The Square Bullet Hole Murders. Another yet, the unsolvable case. More? Others appear more light-hearted. The guys on a couch in an unexpected location. And the murder at the Ukar parlor. Even the rare article free collapsing tenement. Murder features prominently throughout. It's going to take an effort to piece these case files together. But it can be done. Once you're done inspecting them up close. Ken, my cases appear to employ some kind of Naming convention. You mean the alphanumeric? Officer, precinct, time of arrival at the scene? That's the one. A lie. No, I mean a non-numeric one with titles. Oh, you mean the titular? Yes, well, so do I. In our defense, almost everyone in the RCM does. Why is that? It's a holdover from the early days of the RCM. Right after the revolution, when the organization had little idea how to do things. It persists in an unofficial capacity. Officers use these titles to refer to their work among themselves. I seem to have named the case the Square Bullet Hole Murders. Again, in your defense, I seem to have named one the man with the hole in his head. That was a real person. His death was real. Still, I named it that to amuse myself. <laughs> I pray his loved ones never find out. Yeah. What happened to him? Rail spiked through the head. Oh. He died. It was a workplace accident. That's a shame. Um, what's this one? That's it? The notebook is annual. It says 51 on what remains of its cover. A molten strap of cardboard. Everything prior to this must have belonged to a previous volume. In short, there was more. Okay. Count the pages. I have to open an official case. Is there room? There is for precisely one more. Fifteen pages near the end remain untouched by the damage. The checkered grid forms a structure of passages, breaking the case into subtasks to accomplish. Once all the tasks are accomplished, the case is complete. So we've been completing tasks. I wonder if those count. Commit to paper. Sadly, the letter only comes with an old worn down lead pencil. It's unfitting of this monumental event. Is that how you spell lead pencil? I thought it was L-E-A-D. Hmm. The ledger only comes with an old, worn-down lead pencil. It will do, barely. But... Kim, do you have a pen? The lieutenant looks at his blue notebook. Two fat, shiny pens hang from the binder, like large-caliber bullets on an ammo belt. This is random, but um, I love writing in pen, and uh, I prefer blue ink. He is not really saying anything, just standing there, looking at them. Can I have one? No, that I give this to you with resentment. <laughs> with this beauty, commit to paper! The tasks you've completed flow out of the blue oblong pen mm. in a brash freehand uncannily similar to the rest of the letters. The wording comes easily. It's almost robotically simple. A language developed for mental rigor 
and simplicity. The blue oblong pen makes my brain go burr. Inspect the victim's body. Interview the cafeteria manager. It's not exactly poetry, but poetry would be out of place. Cross out the ones you've already finished. A satisfying slash sounds across the paper. You're done, it seems to say. And you, and you. You're a swashbuckler, hey. Pen Harry, and it feels good. Feels like completion. Nice. Things to be done and things already done. The composition of reality. This is an extremely useful tool for a detective of the citizen's militia. Now all that remains is to name the case. Lieutenant, have you by any chance named our case? No, actually. Any ideas? <laughs> the hanged man, the furies are at home in the mirror, the setting sun, shit on a stick. Actually, I don't have one. I mean, the hangman makes sense. Great. That's great. That's actually what I was thinking, too. The hanged man. Good, strong name. We have a very good name for the case now. <laughs> I like it. Simple. Easy to remember. I'm going to start calling it the hanged man. It's good to be sorted this out. All right. Uh, looks like we're done here. You don't exactly close them so much as distance yourself from the smelly papers. They're a little further from your nose now. Browse the case files again. Arson, petty theft, spousal abuse, handwritten logs on dozens of investigations date back to January 51. Stamped case files, commit to paper. These are your last couple of months in Revachon, Precinct 41, Jamrock Quarter. Okay. You don't exactly close them so much as distance yourself from the smelly papers. They're a little further from your nose now. All right, we can roll this, 92%, and a plus one from Kim. Can I read the case files now? Yes, you can piece them together using the alphanumeric code on the margin. It always begins with HDB41, then date of initialization and time of arrival on the scene, followed by the title. For example, HDB 411201170. The next world mural. Wait, HDB 41, weren't those officer precincts? Why, yes, your precinct number is 41. And HDB? Every last alphanumeric in the files begins with it. And these are your case files. It's safe to say HDB are your initials. <laughs> Horace Debbie Berenger from Darjan Binzakin. Those aren't my initials. I'm not feeling them. Wow, I don't know what to say to that. Um, I like this one. Yeah. No. <laughs> yeah, no. How long does it take to read a case? It takes about half an hour to piece one together, using the system you've devised. Where do you want to start? Man, we can go through all these. Um, we can revisit them later. I mean, let's get through them now. The next world mural. This one is relatively easy to reconstruct. Overnight on 1202, a graffito, nay, a mural, appears on an eight-story tenement overlooking central Jamrock. The building is a sparsely inhabited ghost tower, part of a failed real estate development called Grand Coudon. Cause of failure, rent too high. The rent is too damn high. The mural is enormous. Two silhouettes, a man and a woman, are kissing. The text cut into their form reads, True love is possible only in the next world for new people. It is too late for us. Wreak havoc on the middle class. People call it that thing and that fucking thing. It's visible for miles. In two days, the station's complaints desk gets clogged with requests to remove the bummer. You and your partner are assigned to the case. The graffito crew is easy to track down. Only the bell lectures have the literage of industrial paint to cover the surface. One of the graffito artists is rumored to be rich. 
They take responsibility for the execution, but not the design. The ideologue of the next world mirror, as the crew calls it, remains an unknown. Wait, do I ever find out who came up with it? The case files do not show you finding the author of the design. Read on. The crew agrees to clean up after themselves. However, your partner, JV, is against the removal, citing public support for conservation. This leads to a debate in Precinct 41, which then spreads to the streets of Jamrock, ending in a rare plebiscite organized by you and the rest of Row 3. The 9,000 people subjected to the mural's message, all of Lakeside, Central Jamrock, and Villa Lobos, plus half of the eminent domain, participate in the vote. Although the case begins with what appears to be a lot of rambling on the streets as to how juvenile and stupid the mural is, given a choice between two options. Um... Mural. Yeah. True love is possible only in the next world for new people. It's too late for us to have it on the middle class. May I say Cupid? A staggering 78% of voters oh. choose to keep it. Turns out the opposition were a loud minority. And that love truly is possible in the next world for new people. And it is too late for us. <laughs> um, what was it like two episodes ago? I, I think uh, uh, my inner voice was like, oh, you know, word on the street is that you've been saying things like eat the rich and down with the bourgeoisie, or you're sounding like a commie, huh? So I kind of want to lean into that. Um, you know what's funny is that with this game, you <laughs> I didn't expect this, but you, you're learning quite a bit about my own politics. So, okay. All that remains is to wreak havoc on the middle class. The middle class are not to be blamed. It's human nature. I like it, but can we wreak havoc on other nations instead? I must have voted and possibly even lobbied to remove the thing because I don't believe in that rubbish. Okay. Um, uh, wreak havoc on the middle class. I mean, I'd like to wreak havoc on the upper class. Uh, I don't like that human nature, but sure. In any case, it appears to have been a rare case of civil activity in the quarter and agreement as well. What do you want to tackle next? I just want to see, uh, do we have skills? No, okay. Moving on. The unsolvable case. A.K.A. Leslie and Burke. A.K.A. The public indecency drunk and the property damage drunk is a cursed case. It has been passed from unsuspecting officer to unsuspecting officer for 10 years. On January 29, the unsolvable case made its way to you. Why you accepted it, it is unclear. Every officer, and indeed most civilians in general, know it's unsolvable. Leslie will always take his pants off when he's drunk. Burke will always trash everything. It's just what they do. It is their nature. You cannot change the nature of a man. And you can't lock them away because public indecency and small-scale property damage are not punishable by incarceration. The only way for Leslie to stop flashing his genitals to bypasses and for Burke to stop dismantling signage and rear-view mirrors would be for them to stop drinking alcohol, which, in their 40s or 50s, it's hard to tell because of their distorted features, is a medical improbability on par with you ceasing to produce the expression. I'm loving um, the expression. So like in the first episode when we look into the mirror <laughs> and then we, we see the close of the awkward smile, like, <laughs> um, that's called the expression. Um, I use it as a thumbnail in one of the previous videos. Couldn't we just keep them off the streets? You would think that, but you're wrong. <laughs> Where's the fun in exposing your genitals or breaking stuff in your own home? I know, right? No. Leslie and Burke are on the corner of Main Street and Perdition because that's where the action is. Can you keep yourself off the streets? Proceed. Threatening, fines, dragging them to the station, locking them up in the hell holes they live in, locking them up in the station, hypnotherapy, 
even trying to get the local gang of Zemiaki to take them out. The Zemiaki gave them ethanol, so Bert and Leslie would expose and rampage even harder. You tried it all, and still the complaints wouldn't stop, as they hadn't stopped for ten years. It's plain to see from the files that you, Satellite Officer JV, and Special Consultant TH, had more important cases to attend to. You uncover cross-reference to several ongoing investigations, each brought to a standstill every time you drive down Main Street. Because there they are, on the corner of Perdition. And what is Leslie doing? Uh, what does Leslie do again? Yeah, public indecency. Good, you're learning. If the files are to be trusted, that's all there is to it. That and Burke breaking things, and the fact that they're both drunk. But then again, so are you. The case becomes considerably less comic one day, when Burke takes a swing at your ledger. He must have it confused with the property he likes to damage, but the joke's on him. You're drunk out of your mind on potent Pilsner. You slam the hardened plastic board in his face, then you proceed to beat him unconscious with it. So are these memories or um, have we jotted this down in our report or both? In the process, the ledger sustains damage. The compartment within, reserved for permeable documents, is jammed shut. You stop your assault on the now unconscious Burke to open it, but are unable to do so. The officer began to cry, reports Leslie, who at this point is tending to Burke. He came at us and at us. I think he was trying to kill Burko. While trying to kill Burko, you slowly come around. The permeable's compartment is open. You've smashed it open on poor Burko's kneecaps. The good news is, Burke can't walk anymore. Can't get out of his apartment, an invalid. With Burke to tend to, Leslie cuts back on the indecent exposure. Maybe he flashes his genitals to Burke. Who knows, but both drunks are off the street. The complaints stop. The unsolvable case is solved. Which is also why the officer responsible narrowly escapes a disciplinary hearing. The end. Do you want to read another one? Yeah, it's good that we read these anyway, so we get extra uh, XP. Um, the square bullet hole murders. It would be very interesting to read about these, wouldn't it? I mean... There seems to be a square-shaped entry wound in the victim's forehead. Oh. She's been sitting there for weeks, on her rocking chair, with a square hole in her skull, staring at the wall, her mouth agape. What? That's all you got. From the half hour you spent piecing it together, all you know is the entry wound was square-shaped. You never found the bullet. And then another body showed up also with a square hole in his forehead. Oh, wow. A sequence killer? Who knows? Those pages are missing. What next? One day, you may still catch the man with the square gun. I wonder if um, <clears throat> we're going to revisit these cases or if they have any bearing on our main investigation. Next, the couch in an unexpected location. Some assholes brought their couch outside and hung out on it. In the middle of the street, on the roof, on the hillside by the motorway. You know, at an unexpected location. They were young, and they thought they looked cool on it. They looked really cool, like a rock band. Yes, as you've said here, insufferable rock and roll assholes. Young people are the worst. So anyway... You got a complaint about the damn sofa, or couch, or whatever it was. They were leaving it out in all these unexpected and whimsical locations. They took it to where they also took photos of themselves on it, and smoked cigarettes, and drank coffee because they felt it's intellectual. Cigarette butts, coffee cups, stupid couch. You had to clean it all up, and you did. So congratulations to you. Case solved. Did I ever catch those guys? No, you didn't have time for that. These notes show that you have what is called a real goddamn job. 
You don't have time to be chasing down the couch assholes. You have a real job to do. What next? Okay, right, last one. Murder at the hookah parlor. Murder. Tum 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 <laughs> at the hookah parlor. Was a case originally assigned to an officer called Joseph Mills, who is now dead. Of circumstances completely unconnected to murder at the hookah parlor. Wait, how? Beaten to death by a throng of Villa Lobos gang members when him and his partner JM, only initials mentioned, answered a call one night. It's a sad story and it isn't really represented in your case files. Stop stalling and get to the murder at the hookah parlor. All right, fine. On with the murder. Joseph Mills was on this case that he just couldn't solve. Was doing it solo. Said it was a real nutcracker, a real brain twister. Was on it for, like, a month. The captain got impatient. Shit or get off the pot, Mills. Mills didn't get off the pot. Not yet. He kept at it for a couple of weeks more. Racking his brains, running with every theory, as outlandish as they seemed. Still couldn't solve the murder at the Uka parlor. Tough case, he said. Toughest he's ever had. Wait, was Joseph Mills a good cop? No, he was awful. Awful sense of humor, too. The worst jokes you've ever heard. Really rapey. Ew. Still, he'd been on it for months now. Said it was the final case said it was uncrackable. That murderer vanished into thin air. That goddamn hookah parlor was all he talked about. Go on. Okay, so the case is handed to you because Mills isn't getting anywhere, and you look into it. Here's the setup. A young man is found dead in the hookah parlor. You know, those places where you go and smoke bubblegum flavored vapor all day. Oh man, it's, it's 21, it's past 21 already. Um, let's try to finish this. Um, do you get high off it? No. It's soot and water vapor. It doesn't do anything. Really stupid. Yeah. So anyway, young man in his twenties found with his skull busted open, right on the floor of the hookah parlor, in the middle of the day. No one else is in there. Only client that day. In perfect health, too. Some kind of movie producer. Hmm. No one enters. No one exits. He's just sucking on his watermelon hookah all morning, all noon, like he usually does. He's a regular. No calls, nothing. Just sucking on the hookah until 1545. Then bam, he's dead on the floor with his skull busted open, blood everywhere. What happened? How can it be? Mills has no idea. Invisible assassin, movie deal gone sour. Girl at the counter did it. Nothing fits. Eerie. Man just dropped dead. So you go to the parlor. You see cushions around the table. Table's low, heavy, really sharp edge. You saw Tuka stood up, passed out, hit his head on the table and died? See? You can't even read the thing without solving it. <laughs> yeah. It was that. Turns out Hookah does do something. It turns off your brain's oxygen supply. And you don't notice it until you get up to go to the bathroom. He must have sucked a lot of it. Yeah. He liked his hookah. Stephen was his name. Well, what was he doing there for six hours? Smoking hookah. Didn't you hear? Huh. I don't know. Trying to come up with a movie script, maybe. Anyway, that was Murder at the Hookah Parlor. Hey. Joseph Mills wasn't a good detective. Not much has changed in the meanwhile. We gotta, we gotta get to the... Uh... The apartment now. Hopefully we didn't miss our chance. And I guess this would be the end of day one, right? So um, we'd have to sleep and stuff. Um, let's remove the um, remove the uh, there we go the pry bar pro bar. And I hope we didn't miss it. That would suck. Gotta go through here. Past the old lady sweeping. Go to the balcony. 
which is over here. And up here. Oh, wait. A maroon glow of light pollution rises from the east. You hear distant traffic. Night is falling on the city. And it looks like the light is on, too. This door is made of metal and appears to be reinforced. Someone here really values their security. Knock. No one answers. We should return tomorrow. Tomorrow at 9 p.m. No one answers. We should return tomorrow. Tomorrow at 9 p.m. So, we missed it? Man. This door is made of metal. No one. We should return tomorrow. Tomorrow at 9 p.m. Oh. Okay, maybe it's, it's day two. Tomorrow. Well, why not now? Weird. Okay, well. Let's finish the dumpster diving. And then we can talk to guards. Oh, wrong way. Oh wait, no. Um, we can... It's not the dumpster. We can interact with the, um, the ledger. Yeah. It's the ledger you found in the trash. We it takes thing. about half an hour. We already did these. Not much has changed in the meantime. Browse the yellow papers. Of, in the back, you see thin, translucent copy of paper. Some neon yellow, some bright red, all covered in boxes, like marching armies. These look like official forms waiting to be filled out. Then rip them from the binder and hand them out, according to type of form. What types of forms are there? What types of forms are there? Three. The topmost are misconduct fines. The middle ones are station calls. And the bottommost are field autopsy forms each is easy enough to make sense of you don't have to be an intellectual giant to do police work misconduct fine a monetary penalization ranging from 20 to 250 real severe cases allow for 1000 real but that requires special paperwork the details of issuing these fines are spread out over the rest of the fields but they appear pleasantly vague Station call. These are quite sinister in turn. They give a date and time for the person to appear at the specified precinct police station. Below the call are the criminal charges you risk by not appearing. All in a print so small it could be considered downright cute. Field autopsy. A dozen pages of thin copy paper, bright red in color. You see the parameters of a deceased human form waiting to be filled in. Age, sex, condition of internal organs. Yes, all that remains now is to fill those forms and hand them to people. Fines for wrongdoers, interview requests for bad guys, and field autopsies to dead guys. Yeah, we still technically need to do the autopsy of the hangman. The rest of the stinking cellulose is much worse for wear. Being sandwiched between the board and the rest of the paperwork must have spared the fragile copy of paper. All right, let's look at the clipboard. It's made of dark blue plastic, hard enough to beat someone to submission with. The edges are rounded, however. The U4 size board feels thick and heavy in your hand. Light shimmers on its wet surface. On the back, you see the embossed letters, RCM. Shake the ledger. Something rattles inside, ever so lightly. Is there a hidden compartment and something small inside? Light, made of paper or cardboard, or dried flowers perhaps. Permeables, it's not hidden per se. The compartment is made for permeable materials that would get damaged if something happened to it. He can say The plastic shimmers like lapis lazuli, but it is not see-through. You cannot see to its center. <laughs> lapis lazuli, um, that's an upgrade material in Sekiro. I have to look that up, so I guess it is a real thing. Um, how would I open it? With your hands, you four sized pages hang from the clip screwed to the top of the board. 
Oh, looks like we got a good chance to open it. Why do we got a minus one for Lonesome Long Way Home? Alright, well, mm. <laughs> The two sides of the board appear slightly misaligned, like a drawer that's come off its slides. If you bend the plastic on your knee, slowly, the slides snap back into place. It should be possible to just, you know... Slide the drawer open. Without resistance or sound, the two panels move against each other. The compartment is now open. What's inside? Two ticket stubs and a handmade postcard. What is option three? My god. Pick up the ticket stubs. Two octopuses are smiling, reaching their tentacles toward each other in the colored pencil drawings. The tickets permit access to the zoo in Revachon East. The aquarium costs extra. These let you go there, too. I wonder if we can visit those places. Pick up the card. Thin wax paper has been glued to a piece of cardboard. Sounds like leaves rustling when you pick it up. You see violet flowers, floral patterns, patches of glue. Smell it first. It smells of chewing gum. Oh. Apricot flavor. We have that gum wrapper. I think it's also apricot. Exactly like mm. the gum wrapper you found. The same brand of chewing gum. Open it. Familiar handwriting lines the inside of the card. Looped, round letters in a woman's hand. A young woman in her twenties. There is care, effort, and a smile, you think. Although that is not something you can read from someone's handwriting. Harry, it begins. You're already reading. I wanted to write you a letter so you can read it when you wake up. Maybe it will make you happy. So are we, Harry? Throw it away, please. But it will make me happy. A merciful wind blows in from the Bay of Revachon, dusting the ground at your feet and raising newspapers far away. No. You feel the card slipping into no, it. No, hold on to it. Your hands shake, holding on to it. Every morning when I step out and you're asleep behind me, it says, I find a little piece of sadness in me. I carry it in my chest down Voyager Road. It's getting dark too. Every step I take, it grows. By the time I reach the fuel station, it has filled me entirely. I step onto the light rail and look back. Sparks fall from the bow collector. I know it will be like this until late afternoon when I get off the 42 and walk back to you. Keep reading. You, you, every step I take will get lighter. It almost makes me run. Sometimes I do. I can't believe I met you. I can't believe the happiness I feel with you. You have a vast, vast soul, and I will always, always, always come back to it. Kisses, kisses, kisses. You feel the air sucked out of your lungs and the blood sucked out of your head. Everything around you gets dark. Small white dots appear. What's happening? Sparks fall like snow from the bow collector, a streetcar distancing. You feel the ledger slip from your hand. What? No, no, hold on. Hold on. To what? There's nothing. Endurance. Detective. Is everything all right? I guess we have to fall sideways. Whoa. What is happening? Wait. What? There is nothing. Again. It's like the very beginning. Nothing? Nothing, sad brother. No treachery. Just blackout. Just lie there passed out. Well, almost nothing. There is the ground below you. That's still there. And the small light that's on, fluttering. Somewhere in the basal ganglia. Who's that? That's me. Blue eyes. That's me. Okay, seems different from the beginning. And who was that? Who was what? 
He speaks of the sickening longing, the unwell emotion. Even in the darkness, he's grasping for it. Still trying to hold on to the great sorrows slipping in the water. Slimy. No, that was cool. I'm cool. The cool when you're dead, brava. Here in the paleomammalian cortex, we call it the shadow. Because it's always there. White morning. Tell him. Tell him. Ah, yes. In the old factory system, they call it the apricot chewing gum scented one. It's unhealthy of them to linger on it so. But as they say, what do you do? Smells so nice. It didn't smell nice. It smelled like betrayal. Was that the X something? The. Um, that might refer to ex-wife. I remember that from the beginning. Bloated corpse of the past resurfacing. No, it was beautiful. Beautiful. Believe me, stupid ape. Its lack of beauty was not the problem. There was something about a bow collector, too. Yeah, man. What was that about? Where's Voyager Road? There is no Voyager Road. There are no roads, no houses, no lights in the windows. It's all on. Pause. I guess we just lie there emotionless. You think they would let you? Until you disintegrate into biomolecules? No. Someone is breathing on your face now, inspecting your pupils, stupid idiot. What is that? It's cold. Yes. They're pouring something on you. It's in you. And it's... It's delicious. Glowing lights on a dashboard emerge out of nothingness. This is so trippy. Where am I? The upholstered cabin of Lieutenant Kitsuragi's motor carriage, seated in the driver's basket. The air is thick with leatherworks and heavy fuel oil. Cold water runs down your chin. Drink. Water. Oh, Kim. The lieutenant is extending a small canister to your mouth. Drink. The water is cold, silvery. The stuff of life itself, as it pours down your parched throat. The pounding in your head recedes. The darkness parts. Drink. You haven't drunk water in two days. Did you know the human body is not made to survive on alcohol alone? You need a secondary form of hydration. With greedy gulps, you down half a liter of cold water. Some of it spills on the driver's seat. The lieutenant pays no heed to it. What happened? I should ask you the same. I came in contact with the burnt out ruins of the past lieutenant. I was dehydrated when it happened again. I, um... I was dehydrated. It won't happen again. Right. He hands you the waterlogged remains of your ledger. Yes, you dropped them in the water. You dropped these. Are you okay to proceed? Let's solve this case. Good. The ledger of failure and hatred is a special item that can be used both as an interactable and a tool equipped in your held slot for skill bonuses. Find it under the Tools tab in your inventory. This is fascinating. I'm still processing what just happened. Um, so it's also a tool. Alright, keep that. Um, enter. This is the same ledger you found in the trash, only worse somehow. It makes you think about the letter, about the woman's handwriting, about not wanting to get out of bed in the morning. Hmm. It's the ledger you found in the trash. A cabbage of papers hanging from the board, with the permeables drawer inside. It's barely held together by a clip, then made complete by the faint smell of urinal cleaner. Slide the hidden drawer open. Without resistance or sound, the two panels move against each other. Okay. We did that. Slightly. 
ever so slightly. Difficult to breathe once you've done so. The drawer is locked. Blue ink drips from the white pages in your hand. Smell the ledger? The acidic stench of rotting food is rubbed off on the cellulose. It now forms the base of the experience. This base surrounded by a faint air of spoiled meat. The stuff of death itself. And then sprinkled liberally with the citrus zest of toilet cleaner. You know, like the bits they put into public piss bowls. Probably called Fermi Discrete or Axel or something. At some point in its journey, the ledger has seen the inside of a public toilet. Which toilet would that be? That's a strange question. Remember when I said the smell of the upstairs bathroom was so rank they should have sent a poet to describe it? I remember that first episode. It is sprinkled liberally with the citrus zest of toilet cleaner a line this poet might have used? Why, yes it is. Skill point. Among many other things, this cleaning tablet is used by the whirling in rags. Perhaps that's where the ledger was dropped in the toilet. By you. Hmm. Alright, looks like we're done here. That's the mug. The wrapper. Let's see if there's anything new with this. There it is again. The scent of apricots with a touch of cinnamon. Smells like the end of some distant summer. The surface of another planet. Or some ancient temple. Ancient temple? Yes, from the height of antiquity, a long, long time ago, millennia ago, on an island of time you can never return to. End of summer. The sun sets into the sea, but the water does not boil. Instead, it turns to liquid gold. For a moment, the world's store of precious metals seems to increase dramatically, and you are rich. There is a movement next to you. The shuffle of a small coat, warm like the evening. But when you turn toward it, there's nothing there. Where did it go? Why are you talking to a gum wrapper? Take a deep, deep breath. Bitter, citrus, sweet. It seems to grow stronger, like a glow, with every breath you take. Whatever petrochemical byproducts they used to create this artificial flavor, have bonded tightly to the wrapper, or is that just your memory filling the gaps? Until a blossom of skin and flower petals erupts behind your closed eyes, made of toffee, cream, and distance. You just had to take a dive. So we got a new thought from that. Feels so, so familiar. All right. Wow. Um. Okay. We got a skill point. Um, let's see. I'll check out M Motor X. It's just pretty good. Ready and fire. See, hear, smell everything. Quick as to react. Be touchable. Man. Sneak under their noses. Master machines. Straighten your back. Keep your poker face. Hmm. So I know we've been leveling up Psyche. Okay, so we got some info here. I was thinking of um, that ledge where we had our coat. If we can um, make that jump with a better stat for that. So I think this one for acrobats. Player, oh, yeah, let's try that. All right, and then clothes in the trash. Ask Kuno if he knows anything about putting his clothes. Let's start. Read the watermarks first. Go to Kinima and turn on the lights. Okay, yeah, so it is Savo Fair.
Fascinating. Inside, you see a set of steering levers, a radio microphone, a pull-out toolbox, and the soft glow of the fuel preheater gauge. Yeah, I want, I want to turn on the headlights, because they uh, mentioned that we can do that to read the watermark things. Kim, how do I turn on the headlights? All right. Ready? I turn, you press start. It's next to the preheater. Press engine start. The dashboard lights up with orange glow. The rails below the gauge jumps, and the engine of the Caprice Canadian comes to life. My ears! Ow, oh, that was loud. Like a leopard waking from its sleep, yawning and roaring at the same time. Press the button labeled headlights. The lights unfold with a little click, casting electrical light onto the ground before the vehicle. There you go. I'll turn them off from the remote once you're done. We just need to stand in front of the machine now. All right. Stand in front. As you hold your ledger's clip under the headlamp, an iridescent hologram appears. A street grid and the veins of a great river. A familiar sensation washes over you. There she is. Revachol West. There's a note of pride in the lieutenant's voice. Around the borders of the watermark are dozens, no, hundreds of micro perforations. Look at the shimmering street grid. The rectangular watermark is overlaid with the logo of the RCM, and yet the major arteries of Revachol are all recognizable. They shimmer in the Kanema's headlights. Where are we on this? Let me see. Oh, is this where we get our map? He takes the ledger for a moment and then and inspects it. Right here. His finger near the top of the map on a segment of coast jutting out into the great ocean. Seems nice. No, <laughs> it does not. <laughs> Look at the perforations. There are many of them, and they are divided into three separate rows. Tally up the different rows. The first row has 18 dots. What about the next one? The next is the longest. It runs all the way around the border, and then some. Count them individually. You count 216 perforations. Damn. Considering that nice, large number, a wave of pride washes over you. Though you can't say why, precisely. What about the last row? The last row has three perforations. Three? That's it? That's it. Hmm. Hey, Kim, what do these holes mean? Those are perforations. They represent your record as an officer of the RCM. They are your statistics, as it were. I should have guessed you'd keep a record. Officers often do. Let's take a look. Alpha male officers who are proud of their numbers often do. It's meant. <laughs> the first row represents your years of service. 18 years. Okay, not bad at all. What did you do before you volunteered? Wait, 18 years I've done this? That's what it says. I might have guessed even longer based on your age. What did you do all those blissful years of your youth? Got drunk like a megastar, walked the land, probably some boring office job. Like, mm, got drunk like a megastar? Yes, <laughs> that does seem quite likely. Your youth coincided with some heady days for Revachol. But let's move on, shall we? This next row, the one that wraps all the way around, is your number of closed cases. Closed is good. It means finished. You've got, let's see, wow, more than 200. 216 to be exact. It's quite a lot, even for someone who's been on the force for nearly two decades. Usually, Clearing more than 10 cases a year puts you in the 90th percentile of all RCM officers. So you're saying I used to be a super cop? I used to be good. That's some solace, I guess. What's the last number? Right. Those are your confirmed kills. Oh. You've got precisely three perforations there. So I'm a killer. For an RCM officer, especially Precinct 41, which is in the Jamrock Quarter, it's rather tame. I mean that in a good way. There are certain officers who treat their kills like some kind of ghoulish game. If they do happen to solve a case, it's usually by accident. 
it's obvious the lieutenant doesn't think very highly of these officers. But it seems as though you are, or at least were, one of the good ones. So we have that to be thankful for. Have you ever killed anyone, Kim? I don't feel like that's an appropriate question. I mean, maybe when we get to know each other much, much better. But how do you handle the strain? Everyone has their own method of coping. Some more effective or self-destructive than others. He gives you a meaningful look. Personally, I find it helps to keep up a few hobbies. Like what? Oh, this and that. Let's not get into it now. Maybe I should find a hobby. Why not gardening? <laughs> You've already got the gloves. He points to your yellow gardening gloves. Thanks for this. The lieutenant nods. Okay, let's go. Right. I'll go turn off the lights. All right. You can now see your statistics on your journal page, to the right of the task description. Do we get a map? Uh, no. Um, yep. Hmm. All right. So let's see what we can do next. So we finish this. Pay for damages. We could probably do that with card. Track down your badge. Who made the call? Keep searching. Oh, sing karaoke. Race Enigma. Track down. Put the, the clothes in the trash. Okay, so I think we can um, start with this in the next episode. Uh, so thank you so much for being here with me. Um, once again, I'm excited to keep going with this game. Uh, remember to save your progress, and I'll see you in the next video.